Thank you. All right. Why is he showing us a picture of a beaten up old man wearing a Nike hat? He's not. This is a 28 year old lady and her name is Lola and she's homeless and she lives on the streets of Moscow. Now, if you're homeless on the streets of Moscow, underneath Putin's grip, life is about as brutal as you could ever imagine. So Lola's my friend, right? I still send her chocolates at the train station where she hangs out. It's her biggest treat. And as I did this picture, I said to her, Lola, if you had one wish, what would it be? And she said, I wish you happiness. I said, Lola, if I ever met anybody in the world who deserves a wish for themselves, it's you. Please don't waste a wish on me. And she said, I'm not wasting a wish because I humbly believe that if I'm kind to somebody, one day somebody will be kind to me. So she said, please be kind to me, Platon, and tell the world my story, and always speak truth to power. So with your kind permission, I'd like to take you on a journey through power as I've been privileged to see it. It begins here. This is Senator Obama. This is the picture that was taken 25 minutes after he first announced he's running for president. And I remember uh, in his Chicago office, um, I remember saying to him, you know, Mr. Obama, my mum thinks you're fantastic and she really hopes you make it to the White House. So he leaned forward and he said, tell your mama I said hi. <laughs> so fantastically American. Um, but that's not the real Obama, is it? Sort of this is the real Obama. He's much more cautious than we all expected from that early campaign. He likes to weigh up all the options in the room before he makes a decision. In fact, I remember on his desk he was reading a self-help book at the time as a senator, and it was called Be Quiet, Be Heard, How to Raise Delicate Issues with an Opponent and Still Find Common Ground. Very interesting. So this picture was taken for a magazine called Texas Monthly. And uh, this was done when his son, W. Bush, was in office in the White House. Now, I got on very well with uh, Papa Bush, you see. So uh, we, uh, we spent most of our time talking about Margaret Thatcher, and he told me what an absolute bully and monster she was, which I rather liked. And, um, and so, but we both liked Winston Churchill. So this was my tribute to Winston Churchill via Papa Bush. V for victory at the end of the Second World War. But the day it comes out on the cover of a Texas magazine, um, I suddenly got a little nervous. What will the White House make of Daddy Bush flipping a peace sign on the cover of a magazine in Texas? So um, the day it came out, I got an email from one of W. Bush's chief advisors, a real tough guy, right? And if I can take a naughty liberty, I've brought it with me. I'd like to read it to you today. So it says, uh, dear Mr. Platon, congratulations on a cover with cross-generational appeal. George Bush's two upraised fingers may represent a victory sign or a peace sign, depending on which side of World War II the reader was born. However, he says, my three-year-old daughter had a different take. Upon glimpsing the cover from her seat at the front of the grocery cart, she exclaimed happily, Daddy, that man sings Little Bunny Foo Foo. Everyone's got a different take, folks. That's politics. Uh, this is the sun. So they all told me that W. Bush is a really cool guy. You know, you're going to meet him. You're going to shoot some pool. You're going to hang out with him, chop some wood on his ranch and all that jazz. And this picture was taken about six months after he left office. So I went into his place in Dallas. And I remember as he walked in the doors, I realized within about three seconds, this is not going to be fun at all. So the first thing he does is goes up to me aggressively and points with two fingers into my chest. And he said, you better be photographing a guy who's happy and not some kind of snarler. Get it? Whoa. <laughs> what on earth was going on there? Now, I have no right to speak for any of my sitters unless they ask me. And, but what I can do is give you my take as I was there. Now, I have seen power up close and personal so many times, 
and I see a transition of power that's often very painful for people. When they leave office, now they have the very thing they never had in time when they were on the hot seat of power, and that is time to reflect, time to think about their legacy. What did they get right, but what did they get wrong? And I suspect he was going through one of the most traumatic experiences of his life, dealing with the world that he left behind as president. So what does he do? He insists on putting on the mask of politics. And in every picture, he insisted on this huge, goofy, ridiculous smile. Now, I couldn't shake it. And as a photographer, I felt I was failing because I wasn't getting the truth as I was feeling it. But sometimes, the mask tells you more about the truth than the truth does. OK. <laughs> so uh, we should have had a whiskey at lunch before I tell this one. This was my first ever president. And technically speaking, it should have been my last. It was his last official portrait as president. And um, it, Esquire magazine called me up, and they said, we've got the biggest shoot we've ever had in our 80-year history. It's the president. It's his last official portrait as president, and we're giving it to you. I said, that's amazing. And they said, yeah, but you weren't our first choice. <laughs> they said, you're our fourth choice. The other guys were out of town, but you get the gig. I said, still OK with me, I said. And then they said, we've looked at your work, and we're a little concerned, they said. <laughs> They said, what we want is a nice, dignified headshot of our president. You know, like hand on the chin, kind of cheesy picture that we all see all the time. They said, we've seen that you shoot with a weird wide angle lens from a very low, dodgy angle. And they said, whatever you do, do not do that. <laughs> I promise, I said. They closed down a 200-room hotel to do the picture, and they set me up uh, with eight minutes to do the picture. So there I am in the suite, setting up with my little portable studio, and I hear cheers outside as the motorcade arrives, and I start getting very nervous. Now, in the room, if any of you have met a president, there's normally a security sweep ahead. So there were two or three Secret Service guys watching every move I make and one of them had a walkie-talkie strapped to his lapel, so I could hear the progress report through the day. And the first thing I hear is, the president is in the building. Your heart starts beating faster. And then he says, the president is having a Diet Coke break. <laughs> the president has finished his Diet Coke. He'll be in in 10 seconds. 10, 9, 8. The swing doors open, and after this power build-up, you hear choirs singing, there's doves flying out of his back. It's like meeting a fat Elvis in a white suit in Vegas. So he walks in, and I spend seven and a half minutes or so doing the picture I promised I would do. And then I had a bit of a moment. And have you ever had a bit of a moment for yourselves? It's the moment when you say to yourself, it's time to be true to who you are and be authentic. And it's time to place all bets on yourself, roll the dice for better or worse. Be true. Now, I said to myself, dude, it's a bloody miracle you got this far. You're never going to be in front of another president ever again anyway, so you might as well do the picture you were born to do. So I was losing him at this point. We had maybe three or four seconds left. He was surrounded by his team. And to the horror of my assistants, I put on the wide angle lens. <laughs> And to get his attention, I shouted out, Mr. President, will you show me the love? <laughs> Silence in the room. Um, I think it was John Podesta, his chief of staff, leaned forward and he said, Mr. President, whatever you do, do not show him the love. <laughs> We've had enough love in this administration, Mr. President. And then Clinton says, shut up, shut up, I know what he means, puts his hands on his knees and gives me the Clinton charisma, and I get it. So handed the picture into the magazine at the bottom of the pile of all the headshots. And before they went through the pictures, I split, because I was so nervous as to see what they would say. <laughs> Month and a half later, nothing had come out, and I felt a failure because my biggest break had disappeared. And I presumed they hated it all, so they're dropping the whole photo shoot. So I came home from work one day, a little upset and a hard day at the office. My wife and I ordered a Chinese takeout, which arrived. And as I opened the noodles, I said, why don't we watch some TV? 
So we put on the TV while we're you know, preparing the food. And uh, 9 o'clock, CNN, Larry King comes on. Remember Larry King? Larry King stares at the TV cameras with those two giant square glasses like two TV sets. <laughs> and he says, tonight we are talking about this. And he holds up a leaked advanced copy of Esquire magazine with this on the cover. And he says, this is disgusting. <laughs> this is an outrage the way we show our president in this lurid sexual way, he said. And I have invited Bob Woodward from the Washington Post to analyze the picture for the hour. <laughs> Bob Woodward comes on the screen and he says, yes, Larry, I'm in the media. I know how it works. The photographer's fault completely. He planned everything and it's all about sex, he said. The hands are big to grab you. The legs are spread apart. He says the face is smiling, saying, I got away with it. And the tie, well, the tie is an arrow. As the noodles fell out of my mouth, uh, I looked to my wife for reassurance like all failed politicians do in a sex scandal. And uh, she calmly looked at me and she said, there goes your green card application. <laughs> all right, let's move on to the dark side, shall we? This is the only portrait, to my knowledge, Putin has ever sat for outside the Kremlin. And I was told, this was pers time person of the year, so I was sent to Moscow to do it. And I was told in advance that the portrait would happen in the Kremlin. So um, one cold day in December, I was picked up by a black KGB BMW and driven through the streets of Moscow towards the Kremlin, past the gates of the Kremlin, out of the streets of Moscow into a dark, bleak, gothic forest. I thought I was going to get whacked by the KGB. <laughs> we arrived at the most imposing